facilities in the city of Ottawa. Reopening of the Atlantic bubble rescheduled. The Vancouver Aquarium is sold to an American company. The COVID-19 P1 variant continues to increase in BC. Government of Canada invests in laboratories to support science and research in Canada. Hello everyone, you're watching Eagle News Canada. I'm Tiffany Elisassis reporting from Calgary, Alberta, bringing you stories from across the globe. As COVID cases in the city of Toronto don't seem to be decreasing, the city shifts into full gear in administering vaccines. Eagle News correspondent Yolanda Asprias with the details. This week, the City of Toronto is in full vaccine rollout with opening more mass immunization clinics, mobile and pop-up clinics throughout the city. As of Wednesday, more than 800,000 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine have been administered in the city. Let's listen to Mayor Tory. Uh, more than 800,000 COVID-19 vaccine doses have now been administered in the City of Toronto. We are the first health region anywhere in Canada to administer more than 800,000 doses. Vancouver, for example, has administered more than 270,000 doses, while Montreal has done more than 567,000 doses. But we still have much more to get done. I am determined with my colleagues to make sure that we continue to vaccinate as many residents as supply allows. And I'm determined, just as I know Prime Minister Trudeau and Premier Ford are, to get more and more vaccine supply. Last week, the city announced that it would be switching the focus to vaccinating people and essential workers who live in neighborhoods that are considered a hot spot. However, there is a concern that some who don't live in these hot spot regions may be traveling through these areas to boot themselves and get the vaccine. Here is what Dr. Eileen de Villa has to say. People have to make their own decisions around their health care. And in fact, we see this not only with vaccine, we see this with health care across the board. Uh, people often live on the border of, a, of you know, one jurisdiction and the next. And, and sometimes the closest health care clinic is actually one that is technically outside of the jurisdiction in which they live. I think we have to trust that people are making good choices and uh, taking advantage of vaccine as their turn comes up to receive the vaccine. Uh, but of course, we're also uh, really encouraging people and hoping that people do respect that stay-at-home order and, and uh, you know, abide by it to the maximum extent possible, recognizing that getting necessary health care would be one exception. Dr. De Villa also addresses the issues surrounding vaccine supply, as reports of some community vaccine clinics closures have been reported this week. I think fundamentally what we have here, though, is an issue of supply. As Chief Pegg has provided, uh, we are only, uh, you know, stocking our clinics with just enough vaccine to see us through until the next delivery. Uh, and I think we are all uh, suffering as a result of a delay in arrival of vaccine. There were vaccines that were, that were anticipated to arrive on a certain date. Unfortunately, that date was missed. And as a result, we have a, uh, a crunch on vaccine availability. I think the good news here is that there's interest in our population in receiving vaccine and it's uh, you know our, our most fervent wish to be able to provide those vaccines to individuals who want that vaccine as soon as is possible. The Scarborough Health Network confirms Wednesday that two of their clinics at Centenary Hospital and Centennial College will be temporarily closing due to vaccine supply. Take a listen. Our vaccine clinic teams are contacting everyone whose vaccination appointment is impacted by this closure. And we will help people reschedule their appointments at the next available opportunity. We know that this is very disappointing to families across Scarborough. We will reopen our clinics as soon as we receive more vaccines. Toronto reported 1,332 new COVID-19 cases Wednesday, with 90 hospitalizations and 8 deaths. 
In Toronto, Yolanda Aspiras, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Health Canada continues to update Canadians on COVID-19 vaccines as vaccinations continue to roll out throughout the country. Here is Eagle News correspondent André Lejoie with more information. Health Canada is updating Canadians and healthcare professionals about the ongoing safety review of very rare events of blood clots associated with low levels of blood pellet following immunization with AstraZeneca and Covishield COVID-19 vaccine. After a thorough independent assessment of the currently available scientific data, Health Canada has concluded that those very rare events may be linked to use of the vaccine. This is in line with the, the findings of other regulators. As a result, the department has updated warnings in the product information to inform Canadians of possible side effects and to provide information about the signs and symptoms and when to seek prompt medical attention following vaccination. Based on the review of available data from Europe and from the United Kingdom as well as AstraZeneca, no specific risk factors have been identified. Therefore, Health Canada is not restricting the use of the vaccine in any specific population at this time. Health Canada's position that the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine meets its strict safety standard remains valid and the department is adjusting the product labeling to reflect the available scientific evidence. The results of the ongoing safety assessment have been consistent. The potential risk of those events is very rare and the benefits of the vaccine is to protecting against the COVID-19 outweigh the, its potential risk. Health Canada's findings are based on sound and thorough review of all evidence available. In a very rare event, that someone experienced unusual blood clots or a low palate, there are treatments available. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization is also reviewing the available information to determine whether to maintain or modify its current recommendation not to use the vaccine in people under 55. Health Canada reassure Canadians that the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine continue to be safe and effective at protecting them against COVID-19 and encourage people to get humanized with any COVID-19 vaccine that are authorized in Canada. As the COVID-19 vaccine rollout advance in Canada, Health Canada will continue to monitor the use of all COVID-19 vaccine closely and examine the access of any safety concern. Should any safety issues be confirmed to the department, will take appropriate action. Reporting from Ottawa, Canada, this is Andre Lajoie. We live in an interesting time. Warmer weather means summer is just around the corner. But what does this mean in terms of summer facilities? Eagle News correspondent Melanie Ronquillo with the story. Ottawa is preparing a new rule of wearing a mandatory mask and the restrictions of gathering at summer facilities in the city as the city contemplate in reducing COVID-19 transmission. According to the Associate Health Medical Officer, Dr. Brent Mologny, Ottawa Public Health is working on a Section 22 class order to implement new rules for summer outdoor recreational amenities. While parks are important for our mental and physical health, there have been issues in parks during this data home order. And one of the things that we're seeing is a lack of distancing and the lack of mask use in parks, particularly on and around certain amenities, said Dr. Molotny. In addition to, the city staff of Ottawa councillors will be able to give a decision when will be the parks in their words closed during the province's stay-at-home order. As per Mayor Jim Watson suggested, an 8 p.m. curfew to avoid large gatherings and rowdy behavior in parks. However, Ottawa Public Health continuing to report more than 300 cases of COVID-19 for the past five days. Also, Ottawa Public Health is looking at the capacity limits for areas where there have been complaints about gatherings. The new rules for summer recreational amenities will be issued by the weekend. In Ottawa, Canada, this is Melanie Rentilio. We live in interesting times. Eagle News correspondent Cara Cabuso Pasquel tells us why the reopening of the Atlantic bubble has been rescheduled to May 3rd. 
The anticipated relaunching of the Atlantic travel bubble on April 19 is postponed. According to Nova Scotia Premier Ian Rankin at a COVID-19 briefing on Tuesday, April 13. Atlantic premiers had hoped to reopen the travel bubble next week, but saw an increase of coronavirus cases and variants across the Atlantic provinces. We had hoped that on Monday, April 19th, we'd have the ability to move across our provinces without self-isolating in the Atlantic. This is looking unlikely right now. The four Atlantic premiers held a teleconference on Tuesday afternoon to review the COVID-19 conditions across the Atlantic. With the current spike of coronavirus cases, the Council of Atlantic Premiers has agreed to delay the opening of the bubble until May 3. Backed by the expert advice of the Chief Medical Officers of Health in the region. A meeting will be followed by the end of April to reassess the outbreaks and decide if a further delay to May 10 is needed. In New Brunswick, lockdown and travel restrictions in Zone 4, Edmonston Region and Upper Madawaska Region are being implemented on April 10 as cases continue to rise. The B117 variant that was initially identified in UK was found in the said regions. Two confirmed cases of the South African variant were also discovered in Zone 2, Fundy Shore in St. John region. And in consultation with Dr. Strang and Public Health, we are reinstating the requirement for New Brunswickers to self-isolate when they cross the border into Nova Scotia. As of 8 a.m., April 15th, the border restrictions will be put back in place. It means Nova Scotia's traveling back into the province will also have to self-isolate for 14 days. It's the right move right now. We have been watching the cases closely and listening to public health experts and following the science. On the other hand, travelers from Prince Edward Island and Newfoundland and Labrador does not require a 14-day quarantine or the Nova Scotia safe check-in form upon entering the province. The utilization of the Atlantic bubble last summer of 2020, which lasted for five months, gave the residents of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, and Newfoundland and Labrador the freedom to travel between provinces without the need to self-isolate when the number of COVID-19 cases is low on all four Atlantic provinces. In St. John, New Brunswick, Carcabuso Pascual, we live in interesting times. Thousands of people took the streets for an anti-curfew protest in Montreal's Old Port. Eagle News correspondent Stacey Diocampo reports. Over a thousand people took the streets for an anti-curfew protest in Montreal's Old Port. Only 20 to 30 percent attendees were wearing a mask. It started just before 8 p.m. at Place Jacques Cartier, where the protesters stayed after curfew hours to let the government of Quebec know that they disagree with such regulations. It all began as a seemingly peaceful protest, but things went off the rails when some rioters started a large fire. Certain people decided to break the windows of local shops in the area, vandalize their signs, and stole a couple of their merchandise as well. Some of these affected stores and restaurants are Camtech Photo, Britain Chips, Rooney, Pizzeria Bros, SAQ, etc. The estimated cost of the damages were at least 8,000 to 12,000 Canadian dollars and it would take up to 12 weeks to fix, according to Alex Danino, the owner of Rooney. This act is absolutely illogical and silly. Smashing small businesses is not going to make the Premier of Quebec forget about the whole lockdown situation and free the netizens to go out normally again. These businesses are already struggling to get through and what happened now just adds a bit of unnecessary frustration. 
it seems the protest died out about 30 to 40 minutes after it began, once the fire started to grow and a heavy police presence showed up. Seven arrests were made during the protest and 107 fines for violating public health rules were handed out. Only one day after the massive anti-curfew protests in Montreal, more are already being planned. Similar protests are set to happen on April 12th, April 23rd, and on May 1st. In Montreal, Stacey Del Campo will live in interesting times. The Vancouver Aquarium has a new owner. Here is Eagle News correspondent Thomas I Likeness with more. An American company will take over the Vancouver Aquarium. Hershen Enterprises is a leading U.S.-based attractions and tourism operator. It owns two other aquariums accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Other holdings include theme parks such as Dollywood and the Harlem Globetrotters. The aquarium has been operated by Ocean Wise Conservation Association, but it's been teetering on the brink of bankruptcy since the pandemic began. It has been virtually shut down since last spring, other than for a short period of time when it operated at 25% capacity. The association forecasts that it would run out of cash to operate by this spring. It says the transfer was the only way to save the aquarium from permanent closure. Chief Operating Officer Clint Wright, who's been with the aquarium for more than 30 years, will remain at the helm. Located in Vancouver's Stanley Park, the aquarium opened in 1956. It is home to thousands of species of marine life. Thomas I. Likeness, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Eagle News correspondent Vanessa Condi shares with us what the government of British Columbia is doing to prevent the continuous rise of the P1 variant in BC. Vanessa? BC COVID cases are still at the highest levels. The BC government has imposed restrictions, which includes bans on indoor dining. According to the BC Restaurant and Food Services Association, BCRFA, they are expecting the restrictions on indoor dining to be extended up until May long weekend. Ian Tostmanson from BCRFA mentions, it was the most straightforward, honest conversation. And Dr. Bonnie Henry said, look, the numbers in BC are not great. She said, I feel sick about restaurants having to shut their indoor dining. But right now, the numbers do not justify not extending the current health order. Dr. Bonnie Henry was shown data in regards to how much transmission had been occurring in establishments such as restaurants and lounges before the new order. It has shown us there were clusters in about 70 such workplaces the Vancouver Coastal Health Region between February and March that's accounted for nearly 160 cases. The BC government has not officially announced the extension of the restriction, but Dr. Bonnie Henry has reiterated. Each of us has less contact with people around us. We will all see that benefit. Even a small effort can make a big difference in our overall risk in the province. I know many, many people have been very diligent and committed to following the public health orders that we have in place. But we need now for all of us to get onto this path. And I want to thank people who are doing the right thing. But our future path is in our hands now. We know what we need to do. We need to stay close to home. We need to stay small. We need to stop those transmissions that are getting between um, that, that we're spreading between people and bringing it home to our families, our workplaces. Some residents have called for stricter restrictions to occur to curb the spread. As vaccines get underway, we'll hopefully see numbers going down in the next couple of months. In Victoria, BC, Vanessa Condi, Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Government of Canada invests $59 million in laboratories to support science and research in Canada. Here is Eagle News correspondent Jeanette Dozo with more. The Government of Canada announced about $59 million in investments for new facilities in Mississauga and Hamilton in the province of Ontario. 
that will house the National Research Council of Canada and Natural Resources Canada's centers of expertise for advanced materials. This investment is through Laboratories Canada, a 25-year strategy and partnership of Canadian science departments and agencies, which aims to provide federal scientists with leading-edge facilities, greater access to common tools, and reduce barriers to support collaborative, multidisciplinary research and innovation and evidence-based decision-making. The new laboratories will focus on three sciences priorities, sustainable land and resource development, a low carbon economy, and the safety and health of Canadians. The facilities present an opportunity to partner with leading artificial intelligence research organizations, academia, other government departments, and industry partners to serve the clean energy, transportation, manufacturing, and other industry sectors. They will also support collaborative deployment of materials acceleration platforms or MAPS, a potentially revolutionary artificial intelligence driven robotic technology with a demonstrated potential to reduce the time required to discover and develop clean energy materials by a factor of 10. These MAPS will be applied to materials for hydrogen production, battery technologies, carbon capture, utilization and storage technologies and other important areas and will also result in creation of research and development jobs and followed by manufacturing. The Hamilton Laboratory facility is expected to be completed in May 2021, while construction at the Mississauga facility is expected to be completed in 2023. The Minister of Innovation, Science and Industry the Honorable Francois Philippe Champagne has to say about this. Supporting science and the important work of federal researchers is a priority for our government. Our long term vision for Laboratories Canada is to provide modern collaborative facilities where Canada's most creative minds can come together to solve today's biggest challenges and make the discoveries of the future. With these investments, federal scientists will be better equipped to collaborate with diverse talent from academia and industry across Canada. In British Columbia, Jeanette Toiseau, Eagle News. We live in interesting times. Coming up, we got updates on the NBA and new normal travel ideas cruising the streets of Guam. Eagle News Canada continues after this. Events happen around us all the time, in our community, in our country, around the world. Events that affect people, move communities, or simply inspire us. Interesting events that people need to know in these interesting times. We continue to be a competent partner in delivering news about these events. Fast, accurate, balanced. Eagle News because we live in interesting times. Welcome back. You're watching Eagle News Canada. I am Tiffany Alisasis from Calgary, Alberta. It has been one year since Carl Anthony Towns' mother, Jacqueline, passed away from COVID-19. The Minnesota Timberwolves paid tribute to Towns' mother last Sunday and received a warm embrace from good friends and former teammate, Zach Levine. Eagle News correspondent, Tanya Somagi files this report. April 13th marked the one-year anniversary of the death of Jacqueline Cruz Towns the mother of Minnesota Timberwolves forward Carl Anthony Towns due to complications of COVID-19. The organization paid a special tribute 
against the Chicago Bulls, where Father Carl Sr. was in attendance and received a special embrace from good friend and former teammate, Zach Levine. Well, it's the first time seeing him. Uh, in a long time, just wanted to go over there and give him a hug. You know, I know I'm always thinking of him. I think we all understand the situation that they've gone through, and you know, I don't think anybody can imagine that. Even with Cat playing this year, I think it's incredible. So, you know, just let them know I love them, and uh, you know, I'm always, uh, you know, always going to be there with them. Zach was so happy that we were doing, uh, I think, again, to, to big credit to the organization we run here, but the Timberwolves do it hard after my mother. Um, Zach was so happy when I told him that tonight was going to be the night we were doing it. And uh, he was like, man, that, that this makes this game so much more special to me, regardless of win or loss. He, he, he knew this was bigger than basketball. And, uh, you know, he know, he knew how my mother loved him so much. Uh, loved her since Zach Levine, but... Uh, and I just remember, uh, on a sidebar, I, I just remember when he got traded, my mom called me so upset <laughs> that she started crying. She's like, not sack. And, um, I remember um, she was, how upset she was. And, you know, just shows you know, how much love she had. Her. Tune in to Eagle News for more stories and highlights on the NBA throughout the season. In New York, Tanisumagi Eagle News, we live in interesting times. Let's now go for a ride with some upbeat music, courtesy of our EBC Micronesia Bureau, as they take us through the villages of Tamuning, Tumon, and Harmon, in the island territory of Guam. That's our program for today. Join us again next week as we bring stories that matter to you. Visit our website at eaglenews.net and eaglenewslive.com. 
Follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash news and on Facebook at facebook.com slash news. Thank you for watching. I'm Tiffany Alisasis. We live an interesting time.